praise God. Praise God. What a holy Sabbath. I, I told Mr. Busher what perfect timing of God. We started our first service in this sermon series with the shofar, and we end the last service with the shofar. Yeah, I want to welcome everybody. I know we got a small crowd today, but God is so good, God is so sovereign, and I just appreciate those of you who have come out of your day to be here and those that came to help serve and all that. Um, you know, what we really want is we don't want church to be a religious obligation. We want church to be a joyful celebration. So we thank you for coming this morning. And we have these invite cards. If you're here for the first time, you have to fill one of these out. We appreciate that you do that. And simply tell us what we're doing right and what we can do a little better. It's important that, that we get a little bit of feedback. On the back is a prayer request card. If you have a situation in your life like prayer about, please, please, please fill that out. You don't have to put your name on there if you don't want to. You can if you like. God knows who you are. I assure you this. They're private. They come directly to me, and you will be prayed for this week. And as you can tell uh, on our cards, or in your bulletins if you have one, there's a little yellow sheet of card there. If you want to serve in the church, there's some opportunities and some areas and needs that we have, and we would love to help you be part of that. Um, a couple of reminders, and then uh, we'll get prepared for the service. I sing a few songs. Thursday night, we're having some success. We have new families come out this week. NFL here at the Odyssey Church. And uh, this week, I think it's the Texans and the Colts. And if you're old like me, you remember when the Colts left town in the middle of the night. So we uh, are voting for the Texans this week. But we're hoping it's a close game. Thursday night seems to be blowout night. Uh, by about the third quarter, everybody's ready to go home because it's so far apart. I think it was 42 to nothing last week at the end of the third quarter. And then uh, Saturday night, we had a small group. We have our, our meeting where we try to talk about how to make the Odyssey a church that uh, people love to attend. So we ask you to come out for that. Bring your unchurched friends, because really that's who we created this church for. For those that aren't going to church, there's a lot of people that go to church. We don't want to take them. We want to build new people for the kingdom of God. One of the things we've been doing during the sermon series is we've been letting people give their testimony. Started out with a guy by the name Bill Dory. Bill Dory, Brett, uh, I, I, I was telling Mr. Bushel this morning, without a doubt, every single person I asked about the first service we had here, we had over 50 people that day, I asked as many as I could. His show for and Bill Dory were the very highlight of that service, which was completely unplanned. That's how you know when something's from God. And Bill Dory last week, who gave his testimony that day, sang to the glory of God last week, uh, how quickly things can change. He's in the hospital this morning. But Bill gave us that in the midst of trials, in the midst of, uh, of stage four cancer, he still sings to the Lord. He still goes out and witnesses. He said he was in the hospital, and while he was there, he was going to show him Jesus. We had a friend of ours this week fall out, and that's why there's not so many people here. Uh, the teenagers that are taking care of uh, their kids. Uh, Alan Daisy, they found him alongside the road, unconscious. Don't know how long he's been unconscious. Flew him to Christiana. Uh, last night, he was up and talking like nothing happened. A complete miracle of God, according to the doctors. They don't know what happened, why it happened, and he shouldn't be talking, but he is. So praise God for that. The week after that, a girl by the name of Chelsea Derryberry give her testimony. Chelsea was an angry girl, and I know her history. She's got a lot to be angry about. She, she was really as far away from God as most people could ever think about being. Uh, her lifestyle did nothing to glorify God. And then somebody loved her enough to ask her to come to church and follow the stand. Life was transformed. Last week she served on a Christian event called Christmas. They're all weekend ministering to children. And this week she's helping with uh, Bob and Amy Jacobs' kids who happen to be Alan's grandkids with my daughter. And then the week after that, Kayla, my daughter, gave her testimony how she's always had a belief in God, but we had some very difficult times in our family. And she sort of walked away from God for a while. Like the prodigal son and the prodigal daughter came running back to her heavenly father. And then last week, our worship leader, Bryce, gave his testimony about how he'd been in church all his life and what God meant to him and how God had transformed his life. And this week, I'm going to ask Mike to come up and tell us what God means to him and how Jesus has changed his life. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael for this, this short period of time. Thank you, Pastor. Oh, you know what? Now, before you get started, do you know why I played that video? 
Does anybody know what today is? Don't tell me it's Sunday because I know it's Sunday. You know what day is? Today is National Do Something Nice for Somebody Day. That's why we played the video. So Mike is now going to do something nice for us. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> I don't know if this uh, has happened to you, but it happened to me this morning. Uh, I my wrist hand last night. I don't know where or how, but I had a couple of ideas. That, that doesn't matter. Satan will thwart you, Satan will prevent you at every turn from coming to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. What does Jesus mean to me? Jesus is my friend, my companion, my roommate. He's my first love. How has he changed my life? When I was uh, growing up, I went to church all the time. And it seems I didn't get it. I, get it. I went away to a Catholic prep school in between high school and college where they taught me that Jesus be your best friend. Instead of leaning down, you'll hear me say you and your. I talk to him on a first name basis all the time. What you've got to do, and I call this speech my persevering speech, get through troubled times, get here to church, persevere when he wants Satan to work against you. I have a disorder, a seizure disorder, you won't know it. God changed my life. Uh, when I was six months old, I was in a coma for six weeks. I wasn't expected to live. And my parents went to church, prayed to our Lord Jesus Christ, and in a 24-hour period, we had a scientist in a lab at the hospital, St. Jude Hospital, came up with lithium, a new drug, and they fed it to me through my skull, intravenously, within a 24-hour period. It changed from go home and make the arrangements to come down and put my parents on their shoulder and carry them to the, my, to the, uh, um, to the special ward that I was in and they rejoiced in Jesus Christ that I was given back to them. As you know, we're all on loan to our parents, on loan to one another. We do not belong here. Christ has put us here. As I grew, I had seizures starting at age 11, and they lasted until I was 44 years old. And another miracle happened in my life. They discovered I was bipolar, and they put me on the field of fire. And I will tell you, as I'm standing here today, I haven't had a seizure in 20 years. Praise God. It's like a new lease on life. And right now, I have five part time jobs, and I'm open. <laughs> Praise God. That's it. Praise God. You know, I've heard Jesus explain that a lot of ways. I don't know if I've ever heard him explain that in my room. I think I love that. I think that may be. Uh, you may hear that again. I'm not going to give you credit for it. I'm going to tell people it was my own original idea. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> hey, Amen. Right. All right. In just a few minutes, we're going to take our, our, our week, our fucking all break, monthly, weekly, whatever it is. <laughs> and most of you who know me, you know that I don't preach on money a whole lot, but. That didn't mean that Jesus didn't preach on money a whole lot. In fact, Jesus spoke more about money than he did uh, heaven and hell. But the reason for that wasn't because he needed our money. I mean, let's face facts. Jesus never needed our money. He owned everything anyway. What he wanted to teach us was that he needed to be more important than anything else. And he knows that money is probably the number one thing that competes for our heart over him. So he spoke about it a lot. He teaches us it's a, it's an act of obedience. He teaches us so that he can remind us what God has given us. He shows us that the money's not for us. In fact, those of you who've been here, you know that we're not even taking salary. Nobody in this church has a salary for a decent first year. Because we want everything poured back into the community so we can continue to hear testimonies like Mike. It's all about what we can do for God in this world. So as God lays it upon your heart, I'm going to ask Mike to come up and Take the offering, and we just want to do what we can and let God use us to change the people around us.
then you know um, this is the last time you have to watch that video. So I, I remember hearing a story one time about a, a pastor who was uh, preaching and the weather was bad and there was only one person who showed up and the pastor said, you know, should I preach the sermon? And the guy said, yeah, you know, I'm here. So the pastor preached and preached and preached and preached for about two hours. At the end, the, the guy looked at him and said, you know, if I only had one horse, I don't think I'd be in the whole car of hay. But uh, we don't have a lot of people here, but we're going to preach the old message anyway. Uh, we have a lot of illness, you know. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a world that we live in that's fallen, and we have a gentleman with cancer in the hospital. His family is with him. We have a gentleman who uh, passed out yesterday. I'm not sure what happened. Glory be to God. Uh, Alan is doing very, very well right now. But his family is up in Christianity. Actually, I'm talking to him up there. Uh, we have another lady who comes here with MS. And so we have all this illness, and we are a church that truly cares. This isn't really, uh, we're not just tall. When somebody's in trouble, we, we try to be there for them. That's what's happening this week. So praise God. But again, I want to thank you for coming out this morning and, and joining us uh, at the Odyssey Church. And if you were here last week, born here last week, uh, you may not know that this is the last sermon in a series of sermons we've been calling Follow Me and See. And the reason we're calling it Follow Me and See is not so that you'll follow me, because if you follow me, you may see some things that don't glorify God at all. I'm a human, I fail, I try to walk in the direction of false, but I pray to trip. But the Proverbs says man falls down seven times, but he gets up again. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that means more than seven, because I, I'm certainly fell more than seven times. What we're asking is people to follow Jesus and see if he's actually who he claims to be. We believe that if you follow him enough, you will begin to see that God is exactly who he says he is, that his son Jesus Christ is exactly who he says he is. And we've asked you to do that by just following you see, read your Bible one chapter a day. It only takes a couple of minutes. Uh, begin to pray. Begin to communicate with God the Father, with God the Son, with the power of God the Holy Spirit, and see if he won't reveal himself. And some of you, you know, you may have brought somebody with you today, and you're hoping that I don't mess this up today, because you don't want them not to come back. You want them to continue to follow and see. But I have to tell you, today's tough. So if, uh, if if you start thinking to yourself, why did I bring this person today? Because this is not the type of message Rob usually preaches. I want to remind you that all the other messages in this sermon series are on our website, www.odyssey.com and they're also on YouTube and we have copies of them out front uh, in CD format and DVD format. Um, tell somebody, you know, this is national. Do something nice for somebody today. And I'm nice, and I brought you these CDs or these DVDs, and you be nice and you watch them for me, okay? So, anyway, the reason I said the person who invited the church this morning might not be starting or may start to work today is the day that should have brought you. And if you've been coming here for a while, then you already know this. As we've been going through this series, this series, this sort of message got just a little bit more uncomfortable. It started out very simple. Believe, or I'm uh, sorry, follow me and see if Jesus is for me. You know, just follow Jesus and see for a while. See, see if he is who he said. Come to church because the Apostle Paul tells us that you can't believe if you don't hear the word of God. You can't hear the word of God unless the word of God is preached. Read your Bible. You know, just one chapter a day. It only takes five or ten minutes. Uh, begin to, to, to let Jesus speak to your heart and you speak to him. It's amazing to me that the creator of everything seen and unseen invites us. But to have a relationship with him. It, it, Christianity is so personal because it's a personal relationship with Jesus. But you know, when a, when a sharpshooter is starting to sight in their scope, they, they, they may start out here, the next time they shoot, they come here, and then they finally they hit the bullseye. We're never going to hit the bullseye until we're right up there with Jesus, but he's getting a little closer with each one of these messages. Second message was, you know, just... Jesus loves us so much, and we forget this. I mean, he loves us way too much to just let us be on the fence post. So he comes to us, and he says, sooner or later, you have to make a decision. He says, who do you say that I am? You know, do you believe when you do not believe? And, and prayfully, you know, we've been hoping that God will begin to reveal himself to you, because only God can reveal God. But what we're seeing is this is not a lot of investment for an eternal reward. He just comes to each one of us, just like he did his disciples 2,000 years ago, and said, who do you say that I am? 
who do you say that I am in your heart? Am, am I just a, a, a good teacher? Am I a prophet? Am I a, a good person? Or am I truly the living God? And what we find is that some people follow for a short period of time, and they're like bamboo trees. They just grow three feet a day. And other people, they follow for a longer period of time, and they have growth, but it's not as noticeable. Maybe just growing an inch a year. For those of you that have family members that maybe don't grow as fast as we like, be patient. God is still sovereign. And if they continue to follow, He will reveal Himself to you. And Jesus says each one of us has to decide for ourselves. We, we, your mom and dad can't do it for you. Your best friend can't do it for you. Your spouse can't do it for you. Only you can decide if you believe Jesus is exactly who He says. In fact, Jesus even comes to us many times in His Word and He, and he gives us exactly who He is. And then he gives us this condition, and then he gives us a promise. He says, I am the resurrection and life. Anybody who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will always live. They will never die. In other words, what he's saying is, I am not a way to the resurrection. I'm not a way to have life after death. I'm not a way to have something good when you die. I'm not a way to have something good in this life. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. In other words, you can have something good now and you can have something good then, but I am the way. I am the truth. And I am exactly who I said I had. A condition to believe and then a promise. After dying, everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. You will live forever. But then Jesus asks us because he loves us again. Right at the end of that verse, he says, do you believe in this? He asks us that question. And, and you can find the whole story in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 11. And for those of you that may have started reading your Bible every day, you've already heard the story already. But once we believe, Jesus starts to hone it in even a little bit more. He gets a little bit closer to the bullseye. He said, if you believe, you have to change the way you think. You change the way you think so that you can change the way you act. The word the Bible uses, the word that we're comfortable with, it, the word that we've all heard before is the word repent. But so often we think repent just simply means quit doing all the things that you're doing wrong. Just quit sinning. The, the, the word repent is used in the Bible doesn't mean that. What it means is you have to change your thought patterns so you change your actions. Change the way you think so you change the way you act. And then last week, you know, we sort of, as we get close to the finale, Jesus says, okay, you, you know, after you do all that, I want you to trust me. And I want you to trust me no matter what's going on in your life. I want you to trust me in the middle of the storms. Now, here's what I know for each of us, we're probably going through some kind of storm. Maybe it's a little storm, maybe it's a big storm. And some people, they're going through a lot of storms at the same time. If you trust in me, you can have my light. When you have my light, you have my peace. And when you have peace in the middle of the storm, this is God's will. Jesus gives us an example of walking in the light versus walking in the dark. He told us if we follow and believe, we could have his light. He told us if we follow and believe and trust in light, we could have peace in the middle of any storm that we were in. And then, when we had peace in the middle of the storm, God was glorified. And this is the part that I love. This is the part that, that I just think is so fantastic. He said, when you have peace in the middle of the storm, it's almost as if God in heaven reaches down to you and honors you. So when you have peace in the middle of the little storm, God is glorified and man is honored. And I think, how great is that? And But then he just said, okay, not only is that great, because I'm going to make it even better for you. He said, I'm the light, and when you believe in the light, when you walk in the light, not only do you have peace in the storm and God is glorified and man is honored, he said, but then I'm going to make you a son or a daughter of light. I'm going to make you a child of light, and you get my light. Just like the sun or the moon reflects the, the light of the sun, we can be light of the living sun, of God the sun. And then what that does is our light begins to direct other people into the light. And what an honor, what, what a privilege it is to be able to show the light of Jesus to others. We become like ourselves. 
So this is what I want to talk to you about today, and I'm going to tell you this is probably a hard message to preach, it's probably a hard message to teach, and uh, even to listen to, it. And, and, and in some ways people may even find this a little bit of offensive. But this is the end of the series, so uh, everything has sort of been leading up to this point. The question is, the question I want you to think about this morning, the question that each of us need to ask ourselves, and it doesn't matter if you've been walking with Jesus for a long time, whether you've just started walking with Jesus, or you're just starting to consider whether you should walk with Jesus. The question that we need to ask us is, how do I know? I mean, how do I know that I'm walking in the light? How do I know if I'm a child of the light? How do I know if my life is bright enough that I'm pointing others to the light? How do I know that there's really this transformation in and I'm beginning to show Jesus in my life. And, I, and, and I'm going to admit to you that this is really cheesy. I know that. Um, but it's the best thing that I could come up with. And I'm really hoping to help you remember what we're talking about. I mean, think about it. What do lights do in the dark? What should my light do in a dark world? They illuminate or they glow, right? How do I know if I have the Jesus glow? How do I know? If I have the Jesus book. You know, I told you it was Jesus. I told you. But, but hopefully it's going to help you remember. How do I know that I'm walking in the light of Jesus and my life glows to the point that other people can see the light of Jesus in me so that I can point my life to Jesus, so I can point them to it? And, and really, when it comes to this message, there's good news and there's bad news. But you know there have to be good news because it ain't gospel, unless it's good news. I uh, I remember one time me and my wife were talking, and, and uh, she made this statement and stuck with me. She goes, I don't think it's as easy to get into heaven as people make it out. It's always something. I don't think it's as easy to get into heaven as everybody makes it out. And I thought about the gospel that he preached here in the States, you know, we sort of preach a gospel that says if you just believe, everything's going to be okay. If you just believe, you can do whatever you want, and everything's going to be okay in the end. And when you when you start talking about a message like this, you have to be really careful that people don't misinterpret what you're saying. Salvation is a gift of God. Salvation is by grace alone, by faith alone, by Christ alone. There's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. The Apostle Paul said, remember uh, a couple weeks ago when we talked about the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul actually started out not believing in Jesus at all. In fact, he thought Jesus was anybody other than what Jesus said he was. And Paul was a very religious man. He was, very, he was trained to be a religious leader. But Paul thought, and Paul had been taught, the way to get into heaven is that you earn God's faith. You got into heaven by how much you did by God, how hard you worked for God, by perfect obedience to the law. And Paul actually dis despised those that followed Jesus. Now keep in mind at the time, Paul was, was doing all the things he was doing. Jesus had already been executed on the cross. And, and Paul was starting to want him to go after these people that were following Jesus. So much so that he went to his bosses and said, listen, there, there's a bunch of them in Damascus, and I'm going to go round them up and bring them back for trial. He was willing to, to arrest them, to uh, persecute them, and even have them executed. That is until one day he has an encounter with the living God. That's why we ask you to come to church, because we want you to have an encounter with the living God. And after Paul began to follow Jesus and see that Jesus actually was exactly who he said he was, Paul went on a mission. Paul actually spent about 10 years in Arabia, in the desert, letting God reveal Jesus to him. And, and when Paul started his mission, nothing was deterred him because he knew exactly who Jesus was. He changed the way he thought. He changed the way he acted. And he trusted Jesus so much that he wrote about half the New Testament books. Eventually, Paul was killed for his faith. Paul trusted Jesus not just in this world, but in the next world as well. And Paul knew you couldn't earn your salvation. He thought you could, but, but Jesus revealed to him, Paul, 
you're a sinner. You're, you're, you're not a good man. You think you're a good man, but you're not a good man. All these things that you're doing, you don't need to stop doing them. He's still not a good man. And Paul wrote and, and told others. He, he wrote it in his letter. He wrote to some Christians in Ephesus, a, a document, a letter that's been preserved down through the years for our benefit. He wrote to him. He says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for it. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things we have done so that none of you can boast about it. You can't boast about your salvation because you didn't have anything to do with it. It was God who reached down from heaven and by His grace saved you. Salvation is by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. Paul also said, he said, if we truly believe, then there should be some change. If we truly believe, then there should be some evidence of that belief in the way we live, in the way we handle our money, in the way we do our jobs, and all these other things. Paul says you need to stop living for yourself and your selfish ambitions and start living for God. Paul wrote in another letter, this one to the Corinthians. He said, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has become. So we're not saved from the wrath of God by our good deeds, by our works, but if we're truly saved, there should be a difference in the way we act. There should be a difference in our thought pattern. There should be a difference in the way we walk and talk. And notice what it says, because so often we say, well, I don't know the church there's a bunch of hypocrites there. It doesn't say a new life has been finished. It says a new life has begun. We're all in work in progress. We're all working towards this goal, but the work's not finished until we meet Jesus Christ face to face. But as we read Paul's letters, as we read through the other scripture, it seems that believing just isn't enough to get us in heaven. I mean, the stepbrother of Jesus, his brother James, says, you believe that there is one God? Well, that's good. Even the demons in hell believe that, and they shudder. I mean, I believe Satan believes in God. Say, the demons knew who Jesus was, but they weren't saved. Bad news seems to be it's not quite as easy to get into heaven as some people make it out. So what's the good news? How do I know if I'm walking in the light? How do I know if my life is pointing to us, my my life pointing to Jesus' life? How do I know if I have the Jesus glow? And the good news is over and over and over again in the Word of God in the Scriptures Jesus is recorded, Jesus tells us over and over again, if we know we have His glow, if we know we're letting our light reflect His light so that others are pointing towards us Jesus tells us over and over again what it takes to be a disciple now a disciple is more than just a follower a disciple is someone who has come to be taught. A disciple is someone who comes and wants to be like their teacher. A disciple is someone who seeks, not just follows, but seeks to be like the teacher. A pupil, a learner, one who comes to be taught. And Jesus gives us many, many examples in his word of what it takes to be a disciple. Now, in the essence of time, we're only going to go through a few today. But what he's saying is, after we follow, we see and we begin to believe. After we change the way we think and the way we act, after we trust him enough to let him change us from the inside out so that we can have his light, become the light, and shine, show others his light, he says, this is well you know if my light's reflecting in your life. And I'm just telling you up front that this is not an easy message. It may be offensive to you, but we need it to be. And it may be offensive, especially if you're someone who's not quite sure Jesus is exactly who he says he is. Or if you've been told that all you have to do at the end of a service is say a small prayer under your breath. Or if you've been told that you can write your name on a commitment card or you just raise your hand at the end of a service. It may be hard, it may be offensive, because Jesus never says those things in his word. But that's okay. Because when the gospel reveals our heart to ourselves, sometimes that's hard. But Jesus loves us too much. I love you too much. Not to tell you the tough stuff. So the story we're going to look at, it starts out by 
Jesus had a large crowd that was following. And he knew the people that were following at least believed in him in principle. Most of them believed his message at least in principle. But Jesus begins to tell them exactly what it takes to be a disciple. And it's almost as you listen to this as if Jesus was trying to run them away. He's saying this is what it takes not just to follow, but be so committed that you become a child of the light so your light begins to reflect my light that I'm giving you. The account, and again I say this is the account, because this account is recorded in the Gospel of Luke. And, and we talked about this before. Luke was a, a medical doctor, so Luke was very intelligent. He was very methodical in his research. Uh, he was very careful. He talked to the eyewitnesses, the people who had seen and heard and experienced what Jesus was going to it, and he wrote it down exactly as they told him, and then he put it in chronological order, the order that things happened in. So this is a true account which has been saved down through the centuries. And this is why I say it might be a hard teaching, might even be offensive. Jesus is about to show us that it's not always easy to be one of his disciples. You know, so often in today's world, we tell people how easy it is to be a Christian, how easy it is to, to walk with Jesus. And Jesus said, it's anything but easy. Now, it's worth it. The rewards are much greater than if you don't. It's not always easy. In fact, he starts out by telling us we need to count the cost before we even decide to commit to a relationship with him. It's found in the, in the Gospel of Luke. It's chapter 14, if you follow along in your Bibles. It just simply starts out, a large crowd was following Jesus. Jesus is at the top of his popularity. Jesus already exposed the Pharisees and, and some of the religious leaders as being hypocrites. And, and that pleased the people that were under their rule. Jesus had told everyone his message was for everybody everywhere. When the Pharisees had told the religious uh, that the, the, the salvation from God was only for a select few. Jesus has done a lot of miracles by this point in his ministry. He has healed some people. He has drove out demons. He's even fed over 5,000 people with just a few loaves of bread and two fish. So Jesus is very popular at this point in his ministry. And large crowds follow him wherever he goes. Like today. Jesus knew that there were a lot of people following for the wrong reason. They were following for what he could do for them, not for who he was. You know, he, he, they were coming for the miracles. They were coming to see the bells and whistles. They were hoping Jesus would heal them. They were hoping that Jesus would fix their finances, fix their relationships. Some of them were coming so that uh, they could get a free meal. Some of them were coming because they just wanted to be part of the in crowd. You know, they just wanted to come along and say, okay, Jesus is popular to people with him or popular. I want to be popular too. This is the newest, greatest thing. I'm going to follow along. So Jesus turns to the crowd and he begins to tell them exactly what it takes to be one of his disciples. He turned to them and said, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters, even your own life. He said, otherwise, can't be my disciple. Now, before we go any farther, I want you to notice what Jesus doesn't say. Jesus doesn't say you have to hate everybody. Jesus doesn't say you've got to hate your mom and dad. Jesus doesn't say you have to hate your brothers and sisters, hate all your family, hate your children, hate yourself. He doesn't say that. What he simply says is, by comparison, by comparison, your love for God should be so great that by comparison, Comparison, your love for everything else is like hate. It's not telling you to hate anybody. He's just simply telling you that you need to put God first. That you love, you need to love God more than anything else. He said, if you want to be my disciple, you must put me first above your family, above your career, above your money, even above your own selfish desires, your own ambitions, your own life. And really. It's what we've all been talking about. So we sort of poured everything into this great big funnel, and it's coming down to the narrow spout now where Jesus comes out. It says, change your thinking. Change your thinking from material things to eternal things. Change your thinking from earthly things to heavenly things. You change your thinking from following your natural desires to your spiritual desires. And we think that's hard. But if you think that's hard... He says something that we usually don't put into the context. We hear it, 
but we're so comfortable with it, it sort of goes in one ear and out the other. But when Jesus' first century disciples, his first century follows those that were in the crowd that they heard this, they knew exactly what he was talking about. He says, if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. Now Jesus is telling this large crowd all the things. He can't be my disciple. It's almost as if he's trying to drive them away. Jesus is not talking about a piece of jewelry here. He's not talking about a sticker we put on the back of the car. He's not talking about a t-shirt we wear. The people there knew exactly where the cross was. When you picked up your cross and you carried your cross, you were carrying it to your place of execution. You were carrying your cross to your death. And that was offensive. So Jesus knew the greatest barrier we have to being his disciple is our preoccupation with ourselves. You know, let's face it, we all like to be liked. We all like to be popular. We want the things that others can have us have. We want to have money in the bank. So Jesus, to catch everybody's attention, he uses this radical, this extreme, this offensive term. You have to pick up your cross to follow me. You have to die to self to live for me. To be a disciple of Jesus, we have to lay aside our personal goals, our selfish ambitions, our desires for our life, so God can begin to reveal to our hearts his desires, his goals, his ambitions for our life. And it doesn't mean that we can't have the things we want. If there's no conflict between Scripture and the things we want, that's okay. As long as we're not putting those things before God. And we have to spend enough time with God that we hear his voice to make hear his voice so that we make sure that what we want is for our life is what God wants for our lives. His desires, His ambition, His will for our life. And when we trust God, when we change our way of thinking from ourselves and our ways to God and His ways, when we follow Christ long enough, when we follow Jesus long enough to believe, then we begin to know His ways, His desires, His ambition, His plans, His will for our life are much greater than anything that we can come up with. I'm telling you. My ambition, my will, this wasn't it. I'm supposed to be sitting on my yacht right now counting my money. It didn't work out that way. They can to listen to Jesus. And sometimes when you don't listen to him, he'll hit you in the head with a four by four. For me, I think it was a six by six. But what I know now is the desires that I had for my life, all the fame and riches that I wanted, what I had today is much greater than anything that I could ever dreamed about on my own. And then to drive his point home, Jesus gives us two examples. And this is one of the reasons that I know the word of God inspired. Because he could have used a lot of examples. And a lot of examples he used may not mean anything to us today. But as we go through the scripture, he uses examples that were familiar with the people then. And they're familiar with us 2,000 years later. He says, don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost? to see if there's enough money to finish. Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you. <coughs> they would say, the person who started this couldn't afford to finish it. And then he gives another example, one that we're still familiar with today, verses 31 and 33. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he'll send a delegation to discuss the terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything that you own. <coughs> so many people misinterpret this. We don't have to give away everything we own. That's not what Jesus is telling us. He's saying that it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to follow. You have to put me ahead of your stuff. You have to put me before your stuff. And it's hard. It's worth it. But it's hard. It's not easy to get into heaven as some of those TV preachers make it out to be. He said, you have to count the cost before you begin a relationship with me. Because it will cost you something. Sometimes, you have to give up some things to 
that you don't want to give up. And sometimes you have to stop doing some things that you don't want to stop doing. And sometimes you have to start doing some things that you don't want to start doing. Now, now Luke had recorded earlier. This is in chapter 14. Luke had recorded in chapter 9. He says, Who, Jesus, these are the words of Jesus. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. That's the way the NIV translated it. My favorite translation right now is the New Living Translation, just because it makes so so clear to me. Uh, if anybody wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish way. You know, we say deny yourself, and we're thinking, okay, well, i got to do this. Soon. He said, no, no, no. You just got to turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. It's something that we do every day. It's a decision we make every day to follow Jesus. And I think, you know, if you, if you think about it, I don't know about you, as I'm thinking about it, just people came to mind. I think we all know people who at one time were totally on fire for God. They were at church. They spoke about God. And today, they don't go to church. They don't speak about God. Their lives don't resemble anything. The fact of the matter is they didn't count the cost. They didn't realize that following God take something. Jesus comes to us and says, listen, I don't want 20% of you. I don't want 30% of you. I don't want 40% of you. I don't want 50. I don't even want 80% of you. I want all of you. And let's put it in the terms of marriage. You know? What if I went home and told my wife, okay, listen, 50% is all I'm going to give you. That's it. Like, 50% of the time I'll be with you, and 50% of the time I'll be with her, and him, and this, and that. Now, if my wife's going to be happy, not even if I said 1% of the time. She wants me to be faithful to her 100% of the time. Same thing Jesus wants from us. Sometimes we, we make it too hard. It's not easy. He's simply saying, be faithful to me. So the first thing we see this morning is, it's not always easy to follow Jesus. And for those of you that have been married, it's not always easy to be married. Our spouses still expect some things we have to start doing. Probably some things we have to stop doing. Jesus says, you have to deny yourself. We can know we have the Jesus flow if we count the cost and we're willing to deny ourselves. If we put Jesus above everything else, including our selfish desires, our selfish ambitions, our selfish plans, and start living for God and what His plan, what His wants for our life are, which, by the way, for those of us who have been following Jesus for a while, we know God's plans are always better for our life than our own plans. But it's hard to give control over our life to somebody else and to let go of the familiar and start listening to somebody else, listening to their plans for our life, even though we may know their lives, their plans are better. When you think about your kid, why don't your kids obey you? Not talking about the kids that are here with their moms today. Because uh, <laughs> what happens? I didn't always obey my mom because I thought my plans were much better for my life than what my mom. I remember being in my business, and my dad sat me down and told me everything I needed to do. And I, and I sort of snickered under my breath. If I had listened to my dad, I'd be a more money than that day. My dad was a wise man in business, but I thought my plans were better than his plans. That's why I didn't obey him. The same way when we come to Jesus. And I, I just think about it sometimes. I, I mean, does God look down from heaven at me and think the same thing about me that I think about my kids when I give them uh, instructions in life and they don't follow them? When I see them going down a path that I know that ain't going to lead to anywhere good. Or maybe they're going down a path and it's a good path. It's just not the best path. And I wonder if God in heaven could be not thinking the same thing about me that I think about them when they do that. So we, had, we know we can have this Jesus look if we count the cost, we begin a relationship with him, we deny ourselves, we give up our selfish desires, which are recruitful for ourselves, none of us really like to do. But in order to have anything worthwhile, there's always a cost, isn't there? We have to give up some things. To be physically fit, you have to give up some of your leisure time to spend it at the gym or spend it in exercise. You know, I would love to lose weight. But in order for me to lose that weight, i got to quit eating some of the things that I like. And for me, I don't know about Wesley, for me, I'm a big eater. I have to give up some of the portions of life. And to be honest with you, I haven't so far been willing to give up my selfish desires for my taste buds and my portions. I like to be bored. I like to eat what I like. 
You have Chelsea, my oldest daughter. Some of you have met her. She's very successful in her career. I'm very proud of her in her career. I wish she was walking a little closer to Jesus. I hope that comes. But in her career, she's been very successful. She's continually climbed up the corporate ladder. But in order to do that, she has to give up something. She works a 70, 80-hour work week every week. She had to go through times where she was a contract employer and her contract went every six months and she didn't know whether she was going to have a job for the next six months. She has to fly around the country. She has to be away from home a lot. She has to put up with things most of us would never want to put up with. She has to do some things in her career and deny herself some of her several ambitions. Now, my son, don't think opposite. He's not a successful in his career. Now, that doesn't mean that he's not successful. He's just not successful the way my daughter is. He's a waiter. He lives in California. He makes his living waiting tables, which is nothing wrong with that. That's the way my wife makes her table, her living. But he's not as successful in his career because he's not willing to deny himself. He doesn't want to give up his pleasures in life for a career and income. There's always a trade-off. So again, be a disciple of Jesus now. I know this is hard. I know for some of you it may be even offensive, but in order to have the Jesus flow, you need to count the cost. You must be willing to deny yourself. You need to be willing to give up your selfish desires. And we find this offensive at times. And the people then would have found it very offensive. You know, take up your cross was, was, a, was, was I'm not even sure they could comprehend it at that point in time. It was so offensive. But personally, I think this one is even more offensive. He said, if you love me, obey my commands. Now, there's a four-letter word I don't like. Obey? Most people take it out of their marriage vows today. Nobody likes to obey. And I want to stress something to you again. When Jesus said obey, he does not mean perfection. I think when my wife says obey, she means perfection. But Jesus didn't mean it. He says we strive or we attempt to be the best of our human ability aided by God's Holy Spirit to follow His commands. There's a difference, there's a difference between an occasion of sin and a direction of sin. You know, we all fail at times. I fail daily, but I pick myself back up in the direction of my life, hopefully it's in the direction of the cross. There's a difference between an occasion of sin. If your life is going away from the cross, if your God's life is going away from God's command, that's a different story altogether. Obeying and blending both what we know and what we do. And our human tendency is to obey the parts that we like and try to forget about the parts we don't like. We like to obey the parts that we agree with and at the very least justify the parts that we don't agree with and some of the things we do that we know go against God's word and against his commands. Some of you in here may not if you all know, have you ever heard of the Thomas Jefferson Bible? Yeah, the Thomas Jefferson Bible. Now, here's the found, one of the founders of our country, the principal author of the Declaration of Independence, the third president of our, of our country. And what Thomas Jefferson did was get a razor blade in his Bible, and he copied and pasted a New Testament until he found what he agreed with. He just cut out the parts he didn't like and he didn't agree with, threw them away. True story. Find it in the library. Thomas Jefferson Bible. You can't do that. You can't just pick and choose the parts that you like. <laughs> and, that's what, and that's what we all like to do. But Jesus, Jesus even goes one step farther. Just a couple of verses after this, in verse 24, Jesus says, Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. What he's saying, if you're not obeying me, you don't really love me. But here's the good news, because we all know it ain't gospel unless it's good news. He says, if you love me, if you want to be my disciples, if you're willing to obey my commands, and I'm going to paraphrase this next part because it, it's just, it'll save us time. He says, if you love me, if you want to be my disciple, if you follow my commands, I know you can't do it. I know you can't do it. It's not possible in your humanness. I gave you the law, I gave you my commands, so you couldn't see that you needed a savior. But if you're willing to try, if you're willing to obey my commands, I will go to God the Father and I'll give somebody to help you. 
Some translations say counselor, some translations says comforter, some says encourager, the NLT says advocate. Jesus says you don't have to do it alone. You don't have to do it by yourself. I'll send the Holy Spirit. I'll send my Spirit upon you to encourage you, to counsel you, to comfort you, to be your advocate. So you don't have to be by yourself. She said, when you believe, when you repent, when you change the way you think, when you trust in me, I'll go to God the Father, and I'll have my Spirit upon you so you don't have to go on, and I will lead you into the truth. You don't have to do it by yourself. The scary part. There's parts of the scripture that I, I, I'm like Thomas Jefferson. I wish I could cut and paste and take out. The scary part, Jesus gives us a warning, and I don't like the warning. He said, if you don't believe, if you don't trust, if you don't change the way you think, you can't have the advocate. You can't have the encourager. You can't have the comforter. You can't have my Holy Spirit. If you want the Jesus glow, it ain't going to be easy. Jesus says you have to count the cost, you have to deny yourself, you have to give up your selfish desires, you have to put Him first, you have to obey Him. You have to do what you don't want to do, but I won't leave you on your own. I won't make you go by yourself. I'll give you an advocate. I'll give you somebody that will help you and encourage you and comfort you and love you so that you can be led into the truth. So I want you to know that. I'm not trying to preach doom and gloom. I'm not trying to be a pessimist. I told you this, this, this message was a little hard. It might be offensive. But these aren't my words. These are the words of Jesus. I don't think it's as easy to get into heaven as people make it out there. But the good news is we don't have to go it alone. To have the Jesus glow, we have to count the cost. We have to give up our selfish desires. We have to obey Jesus' commandment. It's very easy say you're a Christian, but to become a disciple, it's going to cost you something. And throughout his word, Jesus gives him a lot of instructions. If you just take a red letter Bible, which is the red letters are the words of Jesus, and you just look at what Jesus says it takes to be his follower, he gives us a lot of instructions for that. But I'm only going to give you one more example because I know time is running long. It's found in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. It's very next chapter, verse 8. And it says, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Jesus says in order to be a true disciple, you have to bear fruit. Now what kind of fruit are disciples supposed to bear? And I'm going to sort of give this to you by way of example. What kind of fruit do apple trees bear? Apples. Smart crowd this morning. Great. Do they ever produce pears? Pear trees produce pears. So, if the fruit of an apple tree is more apples, and the fruit of a pear tree is more pears, what should the fruit of a Christian be? More Christians. But it takes hard work. And most of us don't like to work real hard. Here's what we like. Again, by way of illustration. I had one that says uh, something else on it, but it most of us like to put on our bib, don't we? We like to come to church, we like to be fed. And we don't want to get dirty while we're being fed. We're like that large crowd that day. We're coming to church and we want to be fed. We're following Jesus for what he can do for us. We're hoping that he's going to fix our marriage. We're hoping he's going to fix our finances. He's hoping he's going to heal us or somebody we love. We're following for what he can do for us. Not for what who he is. We want the bells and whistles. We want the miracles. We want our demons to throw away. I believe that's why it's so hard for people to find a church. Because they think it's all about them. And, and let's face it, we're all human, talking honestly here. We all have this picture of what church should be like. The type of music they should play, what a church should look like on the outside and the inside. And if you come into that church and it doesn't fit your needs and it doesn't fit the way you want, you just go look for another church. It doesn't matter how good the preaching is. It doesn't matter whether it's scriptural or not. You're going to find something that feeds you because we think it's all about us and we want to be spoon fed. I believe this with all my heart. I believe Jesus is the only way to salvation. I believe he's the Messiah. I believe he's our Redeemer. 
believe he's the only way to God. I believe he's our living God. And until we realize that, we're just going to walk around waiting to be spoon-fed. But Jesus tells us up front, you need to count the cost. It's not going to be easy to follow. But you're going to have to do some things you don't like. You're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to give up some of yourself, some ambitions. You're going to have to obey my commands. Throughout his word, Jesus gives us what it takes to be a great disciple of this, to be somebody who bears much fruit. One of those things is recorded by a man named Matthew, a Levi had who was known to those in town. And Levi was a man who was not willing to deny himself anything. He was not willing to give up any of his selfish ambitions. He did what he wanted, when he wanted, how he wanted, with who he wanted. That is, until one day he meets the living God. He meets Jesus. Matthew, when he found out that Jesus was exactly who he claimed to be, he began to follow and see. And in verse 20, 26 of his gospel, he said, Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life for ransom. And the words he quotes there are the words that Jesus spoke to him. A disciple, in order to bear fruit, must serve. Jesus' life here on earth was about selfless service to others, so much so that he gave his life as a ransom for our life. He gave his life as a ransom for those who believe and repent and trust and obey and bear much fruit. The end goal of a Christian should be to bear much fruit. We must reproduce ourselves. The disciples must become disciples. And the best way to do that is through serving others. Because a living example is always better than a lengthy explanation. If you're a non believer, Jesus is saying, count the cost because this isn't going to be easy. You have to deny yourself. You have to give up your ambitions for God's ambitions. But he tells us it's going to be worth it. And it's going to be worth it in this life and the next life. All right, have you ever heard the math teacher at the beginning of the, the, of the, the school year? He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except thou do decimals and fractions, thou can in no way do out. <coughs> now, the math teacher wasn't saying you can't do algebra because person. He said, unless you understand fractions and decimals, you'll never get out of it. Jesus says, follow me and see. Because unless you believe, unless you're willing to deny yourself, unless you're willing to obey my commands, unless you're willing to count the cost and produce much fruit, you can't be my disciple. It's not because you're a bad person. It's just, this is what it takes. Jesus said, you can't have what I offer in this life or the next life unless you follow and believe. Unless you repent. Unless you change the way you think so you change the way you life. You can't have what I offer in this life or the next life unless you trust in me and bear much fruit. And what you have may be good for you, but what I have for you is so much good in this life. In the next there, was a, there was a preacher one day, and, and he's preaching his message. And at the end of the message, he does what a lot of preachers do, which I try to do, but I always seem to be caught. And at the end of the message, he, uh, he goes to the door, and he's shaking hands, and there's a guy there. And the guy is obviously a, uh, a visitor. He shakes his hand, the pastor, and the guy says, Listen, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really a member of the church down the street. He said, but I don't like what's going on there, so uh, I'm sort of looking for another church. Now, I, I'm a pastor. I know this is always an awkward situation because you're not looking to take people sheep from this pocket and put them into your pocket. We're looking to build the kingdom of God. So the pastor said, well, what exactly is it about your church that you don't like? I said, I'm not being 
said, well, maybe, maybe you need to take off your bib and put on an apron. Maybe you need to start coming to church to see what you can do for the kingdom of God instead of seeing what the church can do for you. He said, you need to take off your bib and put on your how do you know if you have the Jesus glow? You have the Jesus glow, you're going to pick up your cross and you're going to deny yourself. You have the Jesus glow, you're going to obey His commands. You have the Jesus glow, you're going to bear much fruit. And you're going to put on a cloak off your bed. You're going to put on your head. And begin to serve. Jesus says, I am among you as one who serves. He says, you have stayed with me in my time of trial. Just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I now grant you the right to be at my table. In my kingdom. This is the Lord's table. This is not the honest table. So all are welcome to receive and participate in taking the bread and we're taking the juice. This is a time to be cherished, not a time to be rushed. And if you believe, Jesus has granted you the right to eat at his table. I'm going to ask Bryce and Diana to come up first because they're going to play as we take communion. starts at on the night in which he gave himself up for us. He took the bread and gave thanks to his father and he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, take ye, this is my body which is given for you. And we forget sometimes there was a span in there, there was a lot of different plates. Just to pray and eat. Wash the disciples' feet. There was a lot of discussion. But at the end of the supper, when the supper was over, he took the cup and again he gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for me. For the forgiveness of sins, do this as often as you drink it. Because there is one Lord, we who are many are one body, and we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which is broke, the bread which we broke is the sharing of the body of Christ. The cup, whichever we give thanks, is the sharing of the blood of Christ.